So this week, we're about nine weeks into, I don't know, it's 13 or 14 weeks I think I've got, so got a couple more. But today we're talking about short-term mission work and how we can further the gospel to all nations through these kind of temporary uh, trips around the world. So before we begin to look at it, um, I think we probably need to define what short-term means. So when you think of short-term, what, is, what does that mean to you? Okay, not permanently. Okay. Anything else? Okay, maybe weeks or months instead of decades. Okay. Anything else? Just duration. Okay. Yeah, you see it as just something that you're going to assist with rather than completely change your vocation. Anything else? Is your scope or purpose different in a short-term mission trip? If so, how so? Yeah, normally you've got like a very focused goal that you're trying to accomplish during the time you're there. Okay. So, in general, when we talk about missions work, right, we're talking about cross-culturally leaving our geographic area and going someplace where people do and see and are and speak different languages, so everything's a little bit different. Um, so, when we talk about short-term missions, we're still talking about that geographical change, for the most part. But, in short term, we're talking about uh, different duration. So instead of going there and living there permanently, we're talking about kind of that temporary um, known start and end date. Um, often it's a few weeks. I would say most missions trips are generally 10 to 14 days most of the time, or at least most of the ones I've, I've been part of. Um, a lot of missions agencies consider anything less than two years short term which might seem a little long to most of us, but if you kind of have a start and an end date and you're planning on not being there forever, that's short term. Um, a lot of times that'll be to give a missionary like a furlough. So maybe they need somebody to come in and fill in for them so they can have that furlough time. So sometimes they'll have people come and fill in for a year. Um, I think that one of the other things uh, right there that we were talking about at the end, short-term missions, a lot of times it's the scope that really helps determine its short-term nature, nature. So a lot of times people will be going to help with a conference, and you help with the conference, it concludes, and you go home. Or you're coming and helping with a building project. The building needs to be built, it gets built, and you go home. So a lot of times they tend to be very focused on uh, a project or a goal that has a short-term duration that you can come alongside pitch in, see it accomplished, and then leave. Whereas most long-term missions work, it's that ongoing relationship building that you can't really do that necessarily in a week, right? And so there, there's kind of that different mission scope where you're coming in and assisting the long-term relation building by doing something in the short term that has an accomplishable goal. Um, Sometimes people would come in, um, other short-term things, you might be coming in to run a medical clinic, right? Or you might be coming in to teach some English classes for a short term, where the, uh, the missionary could say, hey, everybody in the area, we're going to have Americans teaching English for these two weeks. Please come and see us. Like, a lot of times they'll use people coming in, and whatever gifts and skills and abilities we might have, put them into use in a short-term way to make those connections even, or deepen them. So I, those are just a couple examples of what short-term missions might look like. So then the real question is, 
does Scripture teach short-term missions? What do you guys think? Where? Okay. Now, wasn't that long-term? I mean, he was like, he was on the road for a long time. You know? Yeah, I would say that if we go into the book of Acts, so if you want to turn to the book of Acts, we'll spend most of our time there this morning. But um, the argument really would be that when Paul was going from church to church, almost every time that he was with those churches, he was there for weeks or months. In some rare exceptions, he was there over a year, like in the church at Corinth. And th- so there's a few times where he really extends out, but he's... He doesn't ever stop and park in one place like a missionary typically does when we think of the the common standard missionary moves to Poland, lives there forever kind of stuff. Paul was moving from church to church, establishing churches, setting them up, but then leaving them behind. And so most of his work really would kind of fall into more of that short-term definition that we just uh, defined where When he came into a city, he was trying to establish his church. Once it got established enough that he could leave it, then he would. So he had these short-term goals uh, so that he could continue on with um, multiple short-term works that he just kind of chained together. Um, So that would be a good example. Um, First, we're going to look at, though, in Acts chapter 10. So if you want to go to Acts chapter 10... I think this is the first example that we find in Scripture. And there, there are probably others that you could kind of finagle, but um, I think this is probably one of the clearest first examples. Uh, we talked about him a couple weeks ago and how God sent the vision both to Cornelius and to Peter about um, the sheet of animals being let down and Peter saying, no, I can't eat that. And then God, God says, go with the men who come to your door. And so he went And he proclaimed the gospel to Cornelius and all of his family. And so in the beginning of chapter 10, it says, At Caesarea, there was this man, Cornelius, a centurion, who was known to be an Italian and a devout man who feared God with his household. And so he has this vision from God. He sends his servants to Peter. And um, then... Nine and following, it's Peter's uh, rooftop vision experience. And so, um, verse 17, he was concerned about this vision. He didn't know what it meant. And then there were people knocking at the gate, verse 18, and they called out to ask whether Simon, who was called Peter, was lodging there. And while Peter was pondering the vision, the Spirit said, Behold, three men are looking for you. Rise, go, go. Accompany them without hesitation, for I have sent them. And so then Peter ends up moving and traveling to Caesarea. And then he spent all of this time the next day, uh, verse 23, the next day he rose, went with them. Verse 30, he arrives and Cornelius says, Just four days ago I was praying and this is what God said. And so then Peter spends all of this time, verse 34 to the end of the chapter, And he basically does a short-term missions work where he starts investing and preaching the gospel and connecting relationally with these people. So you might say that this is kind of the first short-term missions trip. Uh, He really, and primarily the reason for this is that up to this point in time, all of the Jews were really just witnessing to other Jews. And this is really the first example of God saying, no, you need to go to somebody who has a different culture and a different background and is not Jewish. And Peter's like, I can't do that. But God says, go with him. And Peter realizes that God is now teaching that the Gentiles are not unclean and that we should be going and taking the gospel outside of just the Jewish household of faith. And so this is kind of the first example of, up to that point, the Jews were just, hey, you have to be like us. You have to be Jewish to worship God. So this is really kind of the formative piece for the church to understand that the gospel is meant to go out into 
Jerusalem, but beyond Jerusalem to Judea and then Samaria and then the uttermost parts of the earth. So instead of bringing everybody into Jerusalem, the gospel was going to flow out of it. And so he spent um, several days there teaching and preaching and uh, the whole household was saved. Secondly, then, Paul's missionary journeys are really the extension of that outworking. So after God has said, hey, we need to go out and be looking beyond the Jewish people. And this is what really has happened with um, Paul. Um, Paul's first missionary journey is really a series of short-term trips from one area to the next. And he notes that uh, Antioch, Paul and Barnabas are commissioned for this work. So if you turn to Acts chapter 13. Acts chapter 13. Start in verse 1. Now there were in the church of Antioch prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manian, a member of the court of Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. And while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul. For the work to which I have called them. So after fasting and prayer, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. Now at this point, we don't know what that work is, but it gets developed over the next several chapters. And I think that uh, one of the things we should pick up from here is that there is a direct, in both uh, Peter's case and in Paul's case, this is God speaking into the lives of these godly men and giving them assignments to go out and do things. And then from Acts chapter 13, it really moves from just Peter being one of the disciples to um, the leaders of a church receiving that mission, that impetus, that purpose, that drive, that goal from God. And it really is where we as a church would see that extension continuing to today, where we as a church should participate in these things. And some people would say, well, hey, I'm an individual. I can just go do my own thing. Well, there isn't necessarily anything in the Bible that prevents that. But the model that we find in the Bible is that short-term missions trips really should be kind of funneled through your church body so that your church can bless you and be a partner with you and assist you and support you and that you don't have to be doing all these things by yourself. And even Saul, when he went out, Paul, when Paul went out, he went out and he used his skills and abilities, but he had the commission from the church. So he did a lot of stuff on his own once he got out there, but he was always coming back and reporting, and so there was accountability, and there was mutual encouragement, because then the church could say, wow, look at what God's doing in your life and in your work. It's a blessing to see our church people doing that, but then it's also a blessing to come back and see that God's working elsewhere. So there's, there's a lot to that, I think. Um, and I don't know that too many of us are going off and doing our own missions trips on our own, but I think there's a pattern where uh, being connected to the church is really important. So Paul and Barnabas first traveled to Cyprus, where they preach about God. So that's verse 4. It says, So being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went to Seleucia, and from there they sailed to Cyprus. And they proclaimed the word of God in the synagogues to the Jews. And so there's this pattern of just getting on the road and getting after it. Now, at that point, there weren't churches established. So they just kind of picked a random route and got going and did something. And our short-term missions trips probably will not look like that, right? It's probably not just like, well, I'm just going to head that way and just talk to people as I go. Now, could you do that? Sure, you could. Um, but our short-term mission trips tend to be much more focused since there are established works in many different places in, in the world now. But for Paul, they traveled by ship, they traveled by land, and it's interesting that um, as you go through this, it seems that it probably was around um, A.D. 48, maybe the spring or the summer, because as they go through it talks about the seasons changing and the time for um, wintering over. And so you kind of get a sense for how long it's taking them. So it's a couple weeks here, it's a couple months here. Winter comes and then they're stuck for a while. 
And as you read through the account in Acts chapter 13, which we won't read the whole thing, but you see that he's kind of making these short stops, getting churches established, and then once they're ready and that purpose has been accomplished, he's moving on. And so um, that's like A.D. 48. They talk about um, spring coming. A.D. 49, likely. They go on to Lystra and Derby. They stay a few months. Um, this, now we're jumping up to Acts chapter 14, um, verse 6. And um, so they're there in Lystra and Derby. So they stayed for a while, established some churches there. Uh, then they continue on to Antioch. Um, verse four, or fourteen twenty seven. When they arrived and gathered the church together, they declared all that God had done for them. So they go all the way around, and um, they come back to Antioch. So there's this, this. They make lots of stops, and then they eventually come back home. And so, a year, a year plus, uh, several cities were visited. So it um, it probably looks like by the way they talk about timing in the, those couple chapters, it was probably about a year and a half. And in that year and a half, they had several short stops, and the goal was, and this is where it goes back to the, the goal of short-term missions is to accomplish a purpose. And so what was his purpose every time he stopped somewhere? To establish a church. So once that purpose was accomplished, like our short-term missions work there was done, and we moved on. Um, Paul's secondary missionary, second missionary journey was very similar um, and, I mean, these are guesses, but in general, they probably averaged about three months at every location they visited. Um, I mean, if you kind of even, evenly divide the amount of time that we think it took. Uh, so Philippi and Thessalonica were established there, and Paul moved on to other churches, other cities. Now, that doesn't mean that we should all do mission work exactly like Paul. But I think it gives us kind of some guidelines for what, what it could look like and how we can be intentional, how we can be sent out from the church, how we can have defined kind of periods of times, right? And in the end, coming back to church to give a report and to share in the blessing. And so I think that we generally kind of follow those broader principles, if not all the specifics. So I think that between Peter in Acts 10, Paul in Acts 13, 14, 15, I think that there's a pattern that shows us there's a place for short-term, very focused types of missions work where we go out from our church into other cultures and communities and come back. And that's kind of what we're getting after in this class in particular. So I think there's a place for missionaries going out and living there forever. And then there's also a place for church members to take the gifts and the resources that we've been given to accomplish something similar just in a more limited, temporary kind of basis. So with all that, there have been some discussions whether or not short-term trips like this are really helpful. So what do you guys think about that? Do you think that there's a place for short-term mission trips? So what are some of the positives? Yeah, I mean, anytime that happens, that's a good thing. Anything else? What positive benefits might come from a short-term trip? Yeah, coming along yeah, coming along in like a support capacity where extra hands make light work and they didn't have enough hands to even get to that. So that helps further their time and their focus on the gospel even by helping take care of some of those things, yeah. Anything else? Yeah, sometimes there's a lot of benefit in your own growth and development as a Christian that can come from it. Yeah. There might be uh, that you have a specific skill 
set that they don't have on the mission field. So maybe they really need a medical clinic, but if you've got a doctor and some nurses or some CNAs, they can come alongside, set something up for a week or two and help people in that community. And the missionary can focus on just giving the gospel to everybody when they come in while you're actually meeting their physical needs. And you can make great inroads. And you can make a huge impact where the missionary would be limited and not be able to do that. So often there's those kinds of opportunities, right, where we can bring a skill set. Or maybe it is like building a house, like maybe they don't have the materials. So we send the materials and the labor, right? And they just would never have the time or the means to be able to accomplish those things. I've been on a couple where, you know, some general contractor guys all got together and we went and built a house for a missionary family who was just living in the back room of the church. And like that was a blessing to them and they didn't have that skill or that ability to do that for themselves. So I think that there's a lot of positives. I think that another one is just missionaries often get very isolated. So when other Christians come along, that can be an effusion of hope and encouragement, knowing that I'm not alone and other people care and other people have the same passion I do. And that can be very reinvigorating for them. So there's a lot of positives. What, what might be some negatives for short-term work? None? Anybody who's gone on short-term missions work, you've never seen anything negative? So I was on a missions trip, and it was some college kids. The college kids I went with, all they were talking about is that we had a planned stop in Paris. And they were like, can't wait, can't wait, the whole time. And then when it was over, it was like they were just like, oh, when are we going home? Like, they didn't, they didn't care about the trip and what we were trying to accomplish in between, but because we had this planned stop someplace interesting that they've never been to, that was the only reason they were really going. So that can happen. Um, a lot of people, I'm, more recently, um, if you read about mission philosophy, a lot of people are saying, you could help the missionary so much more if you just saved all that money and instead of spending it on plane tickets and hotels and travel and all that stuff, food, if you just gave it to them, they could probably build a huge church or put it to better use right there in the field. So that's been argued. Anything else you think might be negative? Have you ever seen where uh, the missions group comes and they're really not very well unified and so the missionary ends up spending his whole time just trying to manage those people who show up rather than doing his own missionary work? I haven't seen it, but I've heard that happen from some missionaries where it's like, oh, you're here. Great. And then they end up just babysitting the whole time. Anything else? I'm sure there's probably other things. but So there's, there's kind of pros and cons to this. Sometimes you get people who aren't motivated and they're just going because their friend's going. And then they end up being a, a drag on the whole thing. Um, so there, there's potentially a lot of different things. But I think that anytime there's the ability to be part of evangelism cross-culturally, there's the potential for that being a good thing. And I think that there's probably three main ways that we could see short-term mission work as being helpful, which some of them we mentioned, but 
I'll go into them a little bit more detail. I think the first one is being an encouragement to people who are on the field. I think that is huge. So as a church, um, in the epistles, it talks about how we as church members are supposed to edify, exhort, and encourage. How often do we do those things with our missionaries? Hey, we got their letter. I read it. I'd send them a thumbs up emoji, but it's paper, so I can't do that. Like, but how do we edify and exhort and encourage our missionaries? I think the best way to do that is in person, right? So short-term missions work can be very, very much a blessing and an encouragement to those missionaries who are out there alone where they're trying to establish a church and maybe they don't have the same support and encouragement from their own local body of believers that they're trying to put together. So I think that can provide them Christian fellowship and spiritual encouragement. Um, I think they can bring um, extra support so that they know they're not alone. And I think another way that these trips can encourage long-term workers is um, providing that practical help. Like sometimes, you know how you get stuck in your own project? You're like, ah, oh, I'm not sure what to do next. So you call somebody and they come over, right? Well, maybe they don't have those kinds of resources. So like if you come along, they're like, oh great, you know how to do that? I've had this broken dishwashing machine and nobody around here knows how to fix it. And maybe somebody comes along and is like, oh, I've worked on those for the past 20 years with my company. You know, like, you just need to do this. Like, how much of an encouragement is that? It's like they have these small headaches sometimes. And God, if you've gone on mission trips, sometimes it's amazing to see how God makes those connections happen. And it's like, oh, I wasn't planning on doing that thing, but I could do that for you. And it, it relieves these burdens that they've just got stuck on. It gives you a chance to be a blessing, and it allows you to be a blessing to them. I think another one is that um, we need to make sure that we're um, careful to protect them as we go and see them as an extension of our church and not just, you know, the, hey, we're going on vacation and we're just going to kick up our feet. So, like, intentionally making it an encouragement to them, like, putting our hands to the grindstone and being as productive as we possibly can be so that they know that we're trying to maximize our time and being that blessing and encouragement to them. I think that short-term mission work can help us individually assess our own calling from God, right? So maybe you go and you don't feel that God's calling you to missions but you get there and you see the need, it gives you an opportunity to think about it in a different way. I mean, I think that... So I've been on several mission trips. The one when I went to South Africa, I remember flying into Johannesburg and we went over... We were driving out of town and we went up this one hill and there were these huge mansions. I mean, I haven't ever seen a house that big even in the United States. Like, just massively huge. You're like... Is that somebody's house or is that a hotel? Like, it's just big. And the grounds are immaculately kept. You crest this hill and there's these huge, sprawling things. And on, you're coming down the hill and on the bottom of the hill, there's tinfoil, steel, trash structures that are just like the refuge of what people threw out in the garbage dump was collected and put together into like a house. I've never seen such stark, like, extremes anywhere. Like, even here in the United States, I haven't seen that. Now, does it exist somewhere? Maybe. But you, you come into contact with other places and other people, and it impacts you, and you start to think and consider, is there something more I should be doing? And you have those conversations with the missionaries and they tell you about their struggles and what the needs are and how 
They could do so much more if they just had another couple or another family who could go in this area. And you, it puts you in contact with considering. So I think that's another very important thing is if there's more need for somebody over there and God causes it to cross our path, is it not something that we should consider? I think so. We should always have that mindset of, Lord, would you want me to do something like this? I know if you just gave me the option, I'd probably say no, but, but do you have those kinds of conversations with God? I think mission trips help us evaluate that a little bit more. Right? It puts it more right in front of our face where we're not just hiding with our normal routine, with our normal job, with our normal friends or normal places. I think it also gives us as church members confidence in adapting to different environments. It's a different culture, it's a different language, there's different food. And maybe you don't end up staying there on the mission field forever, and it really is a short-term trip. You go there and you come home, like most people do. But when you come back, maybe it will have given you a new skill and a new confidence that you can talk to your neighbor just down the street who happens to be from that culture. Or your neighbor down the street who comes from a different culture but very similarly to that region of the world. Would it make it a lot easier to have that conversation? Sure, I, I was just over in, oh, that's the next country around the corner. Like, you can have those conversations. You can have that confidence knowing that you live there and you experienced it and you kind of know maybe a little bit of what they're talking about, right? So can God use that kind of experience back here? Like we talked about last week. Like sometimes foreign missions is right around the corner. We don't even have to leave our county or our city or our neighborhood if we're looking for those opportunities. But sometimes we're just like, I don't know what to do. Well, sometimes mission trips can help you get past that, like, oh, that's not so bad. I mean, they're different, but they're not that different. I think it also allows you to test the desires of your heart. Um, I mean, every time I've gone to a different culture and society, I've always come back thinking how much we have here in the United States. It's crazy. Crazy, crazy. I mean, as much as we've got tight budgets and we've got schedules we have to keep and we don't feel like we have enough time in the day, you go on a mission trip and you come back and you're like, man, God is so good to me. And then it gives you that conviction of, am I using it to the best of my ability for that kind of stuff? So I think it really allows us to test the desires of our heart. It makes us realize that missions work is hard, and there's people who are doing it, and maybe there's hard work that I could be doing here in the United States, right? And I think it also allows us to grow in faith. Uh, so there's this kind of internal growth piece um, conviction piece, growing in our abilities and our confidence piece, but growing in our faith. When you go, I feel like almost every mission trip I've ever been on, I've seen God work in a more tangibly real way than I usually experience back here in the States. And there might be a few reasons for that. One, I'm actually looking for it because I'm like, oh, there's missionaries and God's doing something here. Like, what's going to happen next? But do you go about your normal day doing that? Not usually. So I think we miss opportunities here. But I think that when we go, we can grow in our faith. When we see God working through the missionaries. And then when you get to be a part of it and you see God work through you. Um, Max Stiles wrote a book on short-term missions and he said, Short-term missions trip is an instrument God uses to help Christians learn to trust him 
in deeper and more profound ways. And I think that's true. I think any time that you put yourself in a place where it's outside your comfort zone, it's something different than you normally do, and you're willing to let God use you however that might be, God will give you an opportunity to trust him in deeper and more profound ways that you will actually experience and that you can maybe not touch, but you'll recognize and you'll feel, right? And I think the other, the other thing is that short-term missions work can have gospel, long-term lasting impacts. Long-term work isn't the only way people get saved. So you might be there helping them with a conference and you're going to come into contact with people and you're going to develop relationships and people are going to want to talk to you because you're from here and not there. You're new. You're different. And those opportunities of them asking you questions can lead into gospel conversations. And you might have the opportunity where the missionary has been working with that person for 10 years. You come along and you're the one who reaps the harvest of that seed that's been planted. Maybe you help them make that connection and you get to lead them to God. I mean, if you went and one person got saved because of a conversation they had with you, wouldn't that be worth it? I think so. You know, when you look at those short-term trips that Peter and Paul took that we talked about in the Bible, like, people got saved. Peter went there and Cornelius, hey, let me give you the gospel. And his whole household got saved. We never know when God's working. God was working behind the scenes in Cornelius' heart. And he brought Peter along at the right time. He still works that way today. So I think those are, those are three things. I think that we can definitely be an encouragement to short-term, in short-term work to missionaries on the field. I think that there, it provides a fantastic opportunity for us to grow in our own Christian ability, faith, confidence, where we grow. And then I think it's an obvious, we might have the opportunity of bringing people to God through the gospel. So then, maybe a more practical question would be, how do we maximize short-term mission trips? So if that's something that interests you, and it's not for everybody, but um, I'm sure that we'll probably get one going here pretty soon when COVID stuff starts dropping around various countries that our missionaries are in. And we had one planned, so I know that we'll probably try to kick it off as soon as we can. But when that comes around... And if you're interested, I think some of the steps that we can take is learning about that culture. What language do they speak? What kind of food do they eat? What kinds of hobbies and activities and interests are they likely to have? Um, become familiar with their culture. And you know, just becoming culturally competent isn't the point of a mission trip. But the more you know, the better you can make those connections, right? So if you go to South America, maybe you don't know anything about football or what football means but if you go that would probably be a good thing to brush up on a little bit um, like for example and sometimes it doesn't work right um, so here on my mission with the COVID response team with the National Guard right now there were actually a team uh, a group of military soldiers from Papua New Guinea came to Wisconsin and we're visiting and we're seeing our operations for what we're doing to respond to COVID. And I was able to sit in with some of their meetings. And while we were there, I was trying to make a cultural connection, right? And so I started talking about football. And I said, hey, do any of you know or like football? And none of them did. And I was like, oh, well, that doesn't work. But the reason I was doing that, and it ended up that it created a conversation anyway. Because here at Maranatha, there was a student, Wira Wama, who was from Papua New Guinea. And so I said, oh, well, the reason I asked, even though you don't like football, 
is that there was a student, Wirawama, who was from Papua New Guinea. So I was wondering if you knew who he was because he played on the Papua New Guinea national soccer team in the World Cup, like in the World Cup championship. So like if you're into football and you know what the World Cup is. And so had one of them been interested, I could have automatically had a connection. And they're like, no, we don't even know who that is and we're not interested in soccer. I was like, well, but what they were interested in was that one Somebody from Papua New Guinea came here to Wisconsin and was in school. And I was at that school. And so we still made a connection. And so, like, even though you might not know everything, like, the more that you can study ahead of time, it gives you an opportunity to create a conversation. And even though it was like the route I tried was, like, kind of dead on arrival, it it came back around to, they were still interested in that person and that connection that I had. And you never know, the, once you start doing this kind of stuff and you're like starting to pay attention, like, oh, I'm getting ready for this mission trip, I've got to pay attention to things. You never know who you might run into here and you might have that conversation where, oh yeah, I've got to buy all this stuff because I'm going, they're like, oh, my relatives are from there. If you go to this city, like, you get all of these interesting connections that happen if you're open about it. Now, as typical Midwesterners, we're so great at just inviting everybody into our lives all the time, right? But if we take those opportunities, you never know what kind of connections you can make and how God might use them. So learning about the culture as much as we can. Um, I think that along those, we have to know what things would be neutral, so what things would be acceptable in our culture, what would be acceptable in their culture. There's lots of hand gestures that we might need to get used to. There's the potential for bodily hugs every time you greet someone. Those are things that you might want to get used to. Like when we did that missions trip to France, I was internally loathing the cheek kissing thing and it was super awkward and weird, but basically every time we went in, everybody did it to everybody. And, you know, after a while, you're like, that's not so bad. It's still really weird, right? And, um, but, you know, it's, it's understanding those things and mentally preparing so that when it happens, you're not caught off guard and you're like shoving people away. Like, what are you doing? You know, like, you don't want to do stuff like that. So being culturally aware is important. I think another thing is um, um, thinking about... Um, even Peter in, in Scripture, um, when he was obeying God's command and he was going to preach the gospel to Cornelius, he had all these internal cultural background things being Jewish that he had to move past. And sometimes when we go into a culture, there might be things that we consider normal that are just not there. And there's things that we would consider completely abnormal that are normal there. And so um, when, when he came back and he was reporting back to the church in Jerusalem, he said this, um, You are aware that it's against our law for a Jew to associate with a Gentile, but God has shown me that I should not call any man impure or unclean. And so when I sent, I came without raising any objections or questions. And you know, there's a lot of times, even in our own perception of people, that we kind of classify some people as unclean, Right? or those people that we don't really associate with. But God, God, in sending us out into the world, is asking us to reach every single person. So sometimes we have to find our own internal barriers that we've erected, and we need to make sure that we're not employing them on the mission field, or even here. Um, I think that another thing that we can think about, um, not just being culturally sensitive, but um, thinking about the way that we do missions work, and this is very true of New Testament, and not that we've gone on tons of missions trips, but we try to go to missionaries that we're connected with. So at some point in time, we're going to go back to the same places, and we're going to see the same missionaries, and we might run into the same people. And 
the more that you go back, and even Paul did this on his missionary journeys, that he went back and he visited some of those same churches so that he could continue to be encouragement so that he could help them again and strengthen those relationships. And when we do that as a church, when we go back to those same locations, those same missionaries, we're just further strengthening those bonds. And you might go back on another missions trip and see the same people that you witnessed to before. And maybe it's a couple years later. And maybe they're a couple years older. And maybe they've had more life experience, just like you have. And then all of a sudden, maybe that's the time it makes the connection. And so I think there's, there's a pattern of trying to take short-term mission trips to make those connections and strengthen them as much as possible. Now, could they be to lots of random places? Sure, they could be. But biblically, I think there's a model for kind of going back and revisiting and strengthening, and I think that that's, that's a good thing to do. Um, I think another thing on short-term mission trips is knowing who the local believers are and partnering with them, and that's what we do when we go see our missionaries. We know who the local believers are, we know who that church is that they're working with, and we partner with them. It makes it a lot harder if we're just going and doing a short-term missions work on our own in the middle of nowhere and we don't know anybody. Um, and if you wanted to do something like that, it would still be, who are the local believers that I can partner with? But um, in general, that's why we want to take advantage of the connections that have already been built, and we want to further the inroads that have already been made. And I think that's one of the ways that we can maximize our time on ground, is if we, we can partner with uh, missionaries who are already there doing things. Um, I think another thing that strengthens and would maximize our short-term relationships um, when we do those missions work is maintaining our communication with those people throughout the next year or maybe until we go back. I know that I haven't been super great at this, um, but if we were like Paul, like he kept writing letters back and forth to all these churches and when I visited you, and I can't wait to visit again, how much more could we maximize our time if we really invested in the relationships there like that, like Paul did? I don't know. Paul had a pretty good impact just writing letters. And I know we're not... Maybe you're like me. I'm not a, much of a letter writing guy. And maybe you're not either. But... Um, I think that we could maximize that time if we did things like that, right? If we maintained those relationships and kept them up. Um, and maybe it's even sending, sending something back and forth, like Wisconsin cheese, like, or a Dr. Pepper. Maybe there's something there that they don't get and they can't run into, and they're like, I've always wanted to try this, like, Maybe you can maintain a relationship by saying, you know, when I get back to the States, let me send you some. I've got a ton in my refrigerator or whatever it is. You, ne you never know how you might be able to build and strengthen and continue those relationships. Um, there's a, an account of some high school students who went to Uzbekistan, and they kept in touch with um, occasional short-term visits, but um, the Internet because that's a thing now, right? Communicating via email and on different uh, social media platforms. And they got to know um, some people there in Uzbekistan so well, and this is a, a story that um, I ran across and was recounted, but that um, when their um, one family kept up with them over the years, that when their middle son went off to college, um, they asked him, the family from Uzbekistan, if he could come, come and... and and so they went to school together. And so you, you never know what kind of relationships you might develop and what that might turn into down the road. I think that another thing that would help maximize our time on the mission field is employing some of the principles and practices here at home. Being culturally aware going outside your comfort zone to talk to those people you don't normally talk to that you think are, well, I don't, uh, nobody likes talking to them. I mean, when we say that, are we saying they don't need the gospel? So we might be creating 
things that would make it difficult for us to go on short-term missions trips. So how can we be thinking like a short-term missionary even in our own neighborhoods? So a few things to consider. So in conclusion, I'm actually going to end like on time today. In conclusion, um, I think short-term missions trips can be very beneficial, can be very helpful, and it can be a fruitful way to help further the cause of the gospel if they're done well. If they're done poorly, they can be a huge drain and a huge damage to the testimony of missionaries there. And so they have the potential of doing great good and great harm. So for us as a church, when we consider that, we need to make sure that we're going with the right motives, with the right attitudes, that we've taken the time to internally prepare our own hearts and minds for going prior to that date, not just signing up, yeah, Bahamas, can't wait to go. That's a great mission trip, right? So I think they can be very fruitful if we're going with the right heart and the right attitude and the right mindset. I think biblically, sending out short-term missions is really a responsibility of the church, and we saw that in Acts. And so, you know, if there's something that you want to do or you see an opportunity, bring it under the umbrella of the church so that we can all participate and we can all be a blessing and encouragement and support to you in doing that. Um, because in Acts, the church was the one who commissioned and blessed and sent out. Um, I think that another thing is that it takes a lot of planning ahead. And when it takes planning ahead, that means that we, as church members, should also be planning ahead. What am I going to do with my vacation time? Am I setting aside money where I could potentially send myself on a mission trip? Um, if we never plan those things ahead, they'll never happen. And that's where we have to think about, God has blessed me with so much. How am I using it? Does he want me to use it on a mission trip, on a short-term thing? He might, right? So start considering and praying about those.